Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Walter Koroshetz here to give you the NINDS Director's Report for the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at our February Council meeting. We're going to talk about our budget. We're going to talk about the effects of COVID-19 on the research enterprise, new research programs coming out to focus on recovery from COVID-19 infection and the post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 infection, new resources for myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome research, upcoming workshops, new evaluation working groups of the council. And I, I wanna start off by thanking our staff and the entire neuroscience community, including our, the subjects in our clinical research projects and our nonprofit disease um, uh, and uh, professional partners uh, who've all uh, been working hard over the last difficult months to advance our shared mission uh, to improve our fundamental understanding of the nervous system and to use that knowledge to reduce the burden of neurological disorders. I want to start off by showing uh, uh, some of the budget slides that are important in understanding our funding policies. Uh, so you can see here over the years, these are the uh, appropriations to the NINDS uh, based budget. Um, we received uh, really generous increases uh, in a number of years, but that has slightly decreased this year down to 1.75%. And so there are implications of that uh, decrease into what we can fund. Um, this shows the increase in NIH over time, the percentage changes to the NIH budget over time. Um, and in addition to um, the base budget, uh, NINDS also manages about $245.7 million from the National Institute of Aging to administer the Alzheimer's disease and related dementia research grants. As mentioned, this appropriation does not include the monies for the HEAL brain and, uh, and brain initiative. Uh, the next slide shows that base figure again, which is the 1.75% increase, uh, but also the increase um, to the base budget for brain initiative research and uh, increases for a brain initiative from the 21st Century Cures Act and increases to the base budget for the Helping to End Addiction Long-Term uh, Initiative. And the total appropriation then uh, for what we manage in addition to the Alzheimer's disease related dementia money I mentioned earlier, it's uh, that plus $2.5 billion, which is a 2.8% increase uh, in the total um, funds managed by NINDS. This shows uh, some of the trends in the number of applications and awards over the last couple of years. And you can see in 2020, we saw an increase uh, in the number of applications. And again, uh, despite COVID, we are seeing uh, similar uh, increases in applications um, uh, in 2021. Uh, we have looked at the uh, percentage of R01 applications with male, male, females and males, and that's remained fairly steady in 2020. Um, the number of trainee applications, however, as you can see here is going up, uh, which is a good thing. We are trying to bring more people into neuroscience and successful doing that. And unfortunately, our success in new applications from underrepresented minority groups is not, has been a very difficult uh, thing to move and it actually dipped slightly in 2020, but these numbers are pretty small. So looking to, the, to 2021, um, what we see is that the increases in our budget allowed us to fund more new grants over a number of years, uh, but that increase uh, did not, was not sustained this year. So we actually have less money for new grants this year, 342 million.91 compared to uh, 2020, 2020 when we had 431.80 million uh, for uh, new grants to fund. And funding these new grants incurs out year obligations, which uh, therefore increased our obligations here, seen over a billion dollars now compared to say 888 million in uh, 2019. Because of this, we had to reduce our percentile for a pay line uh, to about 14 percentile compared to 16 percentile in 19 and 20. And that's due in, in part to the fact that we have less competing money. It's also due to the fact that the cost 
for grant has increased. So it was 414 in 2017, 477K in 2020. And now our estimate, it's uh, another 35K increase. So over uh, 500,000, the average cost of a grant in 2021. Uh, that together with the increase in application number and the decrease of, of available competing funds uh, means that we had to drop our percentile uh, at pay line. I would note that we fund R35 grants, which we'll talk about in a second, which are the equivalent of R01s. They're eight-year grants. And so uh, including that, the, the percentile is, it's, that accounts for about one or two percentile points um, uh, as well. Um, we um, plan to control the increase in, in cost of these grants by um, uh, increasing the administrative cuts from 17.5% to 20% on the non-modular grants. Note, we do not anymore cut the non-modular, uh, cut the modular awards. This pie graph shows the um, distribution of funds in the various different research areas. So you can see here's the R01 equivalent grants, the R35 grants, and the R01s. So the vast majority of our grants goes to this initi investigate initiated um, research. Um, there are small grants like the R21 seen here in yellow, uh, other uh, center grants, translational programs seen here in orange, networks for clinical trials and, and infrastructure in dark green, uh, other clinical trials in the light green, and uh, training grants here in the deep purple and contracts and miscellaneous uh, also in this pie chart, which gets us to about $1.634 billion for uh, research to the extramural community um, in uh, 2020. Um, now I'm gonna shift a little bit to talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, this is a study um, came out of Dr. Avi Nath's group at Intramural NINDS showing uh, the effects of the virus in, at, in patho pathological specimens. And the take home point was it's very difficult to find virus in the brain, um, but the cases that they received at PATH um, had evidence of blood brain barrier breakdown in multiple different small multifocal areas. Some of these in the deep brain stem, some in the uh, olfactory bulb. And, uh, and this allows um, uh, proteins and other chemicals from the blood to pass into the brain, pass that normal blood brain barrier. It also incites inflammation in these various regions. Um, that's um, kind of what we know so far about its effects in the brain. Um, but we do know that, uh, that COVID-19 has a number of neurologic uh, uh, consequences in the acute stage, uh, seizures, encephalopathy, delirium, uh, muscular weakness. Um, but what we're now concentrating on uh, more so than ever is the recovery process. And, and this is actually much slower than one would have hoped. Uh, in hospitalized patients, about 50% of people still have significant symptoms even two to three months after they've left the hospital. Uh, this is a study from the CDC in non-hospitalized patients. So these are relatively mild affected patients, but still at two to three weeks, 35% have not returned to baseline. Um, and uh, this, this co uh, contrasts with what would have expected with influenza, in which 90% of people would have recovered within those two week period. And this shows the symptoms and almost all the studies in this area show that the major problem is fatigue, uh, along with trouble with uh, memory, concentration, um, there's uh, sleep disorders that are, that are quite common uh, and uh, pain syndromes, chest pain, musculoskeletal, uh, um, joint pain, um, and, uh, and a variety of other uh, non-neurological conditions, chest pain, hard to know what that's due to, but many patients are, are also complaining of continued dyspnea uh, despite normal pulmonary function tests. Um, exercise intolerance, uh, GI trouble. So COVID affects uh, all organ systems in the body, uh, but the um, post-COVID problems are heavily in the space of, 
that fall under NINDS. Also to say under NIMH, as there's a great deal of post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and depression. Um, so uh, um, this is a, a major area uh, for future research in uh, NIH. Uh, uh, really appreciates that uh, Congress saw this, uh, appropriated $1.15 billion for research and clinical trials related to long-term studies of COVID-19. This money is available until 2024. And um, we are developing with many other institutes at NIH, particularly NIAID and the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute uh, to develop a research program that could rapidly improve our understanding of and the ability to treat and prevent post-acute sequelae of COVID uh, research, COVID, COVID infection. The key scientific questions are to really understand how, what is the process of recovery from this viral infection and understanding the heterogeneity and the rapidity in which people do recover. And for those patients who do not fully recover or develop new symptoms of sequelae, What's the incidence, prevalence, clinical spectrum, underlying biology, and, and best treatments? Um, so this is a program that I think will go on for a number of years. We really need to know what are the effects of COVID long-term on these persistent symptoms that people experience, but also on the risk factor, risks of developing um, common disorders such as atherosclerosis or dementia in the future in those who have been exposed to the virus. Um, so the plan is to, uh, uh, to fund uh, clinical research that will look at cohorts of folks who have been infected with COVID and then follow how they recover, and then also to recruit folks who have had consistent trouble um, in the period, uh, weeks or months after they've been infected, they have persistent symptoms or new symptoms, and to try and understand what that biologic basis is. And this will be a match with a larger population studies, probably using electronic health record or health systems-based studies to look at the outcomes of tens of thousands, if not millions of people who have been infected with this virus and to follow them over time um, for signals that are related to uh, long-term health. Um, as I mentioned, fatigue is a major component of the problems that people are suffering from after COVID, uh, but it's, it's clearly not simply related to fatigue, although there are overlaps with, um, with people who have a chronic fatigue syndrome, ME-CFS complaining of. So we think that the research in um, the post-acute COVID space will really elucidate a lot of the biology under, underlying ME-CFS and we also have some new uh, tools that are going to become available um, for MECFS. MAP MECFS is an on online data sharing platform that allows researchers to discover, share, and access uh, data from multi omic studies. And Search MECFS is a new uh, resource to provide access to biospecimens and clinical information uh, from individuals with MECFS and controls. And later today, uh, we will be looking for concept clearance for renewal of the Collaborative Research Centers and Data Management Coordinating Center for MECFS that we fund with the uh, NIAID. Um, so we look forward to that. There are a number of workshops that are coming up. The Brain Initiative uh, has a series of workshops which are charting the course of the new transformative projects that will be rolled out, one of which is, the, is understanding and identifying the complete mapping of neural circuits in the brain. So there's a brain connectivity workshop series coming up, a number of them jointly hosted by the Brain Initiative and also the Department of Energy Office of Science. Because to do these kind of large scale connectomic projects, we really need the help of the Department of Energy and their resources um, at the national laboratories. Um, there'll also be a human brain cell census workshop coming up. Uh, to move from the mouse uh, into uh, the brain and charting the cell census uh, based on uh, transcriptomic, morphological, and physiological properties. It's been quite successful in, the, in, in analysis of the mouse brain. We now think that we can move into the human brain. Um, and this has uh, tremendous downstream uh, potential to advance 
neuroscience in general, but also um, the understanding of different disease processes. Uh, there's a non-invasive imaging technology workshop coming up as well to develop and disseminate technologies and non-invasive imaging of human brain function. And the Big Brain Investigator meeting will be virtual in June. Um, there are a number of other workshops. The HEAL initiative is focused uh, on improving patient engagement, improving diversity in, in, and inclusion in our clinical trials. And there's a series of them, the next one coming March 15th. Uh, workshop in post-traumatic epilepsy, a um, uh, workshop on uh, improving uh, diversity uh, throughout the Blueprint Neuroscience Institutes and uh, advances in pain research being sponsored by the NIH Pain Consortium. We are also working hard. Dr. Richard Benson uh, is taking the point in developing a strategic plan for NINDS to improve health disparities and inequities in neurological disorders. And it also bring your attention to a series of National Academy workshops in neuroscience training. Uh, there are four of those, two of them are, or, uh, three of them already taken place. And there's one more in February 16th, re-envisioning postdoctoral training in neuroscience. Um, there's been um, a, a great deal of emphasis put on improving diversity uh, in our workforce and bring diverse perspectives to our science. Um, one thing we want to put out to all those uh, interested in neuroscience is this opportunity called the FIRST Award, Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation. This is a common fund project that will uh, uh, put $241 million to uh, inclusive hiring of cohorts of scientists into departments that would improve the diversity of that department. Um, so this cohort modeling we think is a high chance of being successful because the people brought in can work together as a team uh, to, uh, in, to ensure their, their professional success. And also the, the institutions um, who will be involved will develop programs to uh, advance inclusive, inclusiveness um, throughout their departments and institutions. Uh, we would like that, uh, that neuroscientists, cohorts of neuroscientists are hired into this program. So that's why we really want to message this out um, to get the word out that um, this is going to be coming. And uh, we would love to have neuroscientists uh, hired as part of this cohort. <clears throat> there are a couple of evaluations that we're going to be planning. One is to evaluate our clinical trial networks, Neuronext, um, for uh, phase two trials in in patients. And the second is stroke net, which were for phase two and four phase three trials in stroke. Um, uh, we appreciate Dr. Ed Trevathans, um, who volunteered to join a working group of the council that will assess both these networks. And we'll be working with him and, uh, and a group over the next couple of months uh, to do this um, and report to the council back to you in February, 2022. And also a, um, a process, uh, again, linked to our council, Dr. Tom, Mike, Tom Carmichael has agreed to join this expert, expert panel to review our intramural clinical research program and our director, Dr. Avi Nath. Um, so we really appreciate the work of the council and the other members of these committees and these important evaluation processes. Now, I, I'd like to turn to the fact that uh, we are, uh, in a, a terrible situation with the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, our laboratory has been affected. The neuroscience uh, research infrastructure has been uh, badly hobbled. Uh, just now coming out uh, to come up to maybe half speed again. Um, but there is science that has led to solutions, particularly the vaccines. And, um, and NIH has had a, a tremendous role in uh, developing testing and validating these therapeutics, which you hope will be really important solutions to this problem. Um, uh, despite uh, COVID, there have been tr uh, tremendous advances in neuroscience. And, and uh, so these were outlined in the director's message at the end of December. Um, so fantastic uh, advances um, and appreciate all the work of people um, who have uh, you know, persevered um, through this time period. Our problems don't go away. Um, 
and, uh, and, and so people working on them uh, greatly appreciated. And I just want to end up on the lighter side that not only is the work that we do uh, so incredibly important uh, to patients and to our understanding of the nervous system, but it's, uh, it's a vocation that can really engender passion for the science as kind of brought out by the beauty of, of neuroscience uh, seen here in the intramural research image contest uh, winner um, photos. So I want to thank everybody, and um, we'll now go into our discussion uh, and uh, answer questions, uh, and go into our discussion of uh, COVID-19 uh, relief as best we can for uh, the neuroscience uh, that we support. So thank you very much.